Have you ever said a word a bunch of times in a row and it starts to sound weird? Like if you just kept saying the word spoon a bunch of times again and again, eventually that word would start to sound weird? Spoon, 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 spoon. Come on, you know you wanna do it with me. I actually looked this up. This is a documented psychological phenomenon called semantic satiation. It's so crazy that we can know a word so closely that in a matter of minutes have this experience where we aren't even sure if it means anything or if it's even a word anymore, simply by repeating it over and over again. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking all about doubt. Whether we've been following Jesus for five months or five years or five decades, doubt is a healthy and natural part of our journey. What we believe isn't always black and white. The story God invites us into is one filled with conflict, ambiguity, and mystery. So if doubt is not a bad thing, what do we do with it when we have it? How do we doubt well? For starters, let's be real. Doubt isn't just about answers for the parts of our beliefs that we are confused or struggling with. In doubt, our temptation is to find answers. But doubting well isn't just about finding clean and short answers to all our questions. Doubting is about both belief and faith. Beliefs are all our thoughts and ways of thinking about God, the Bible, and what he has done and is doing in our world. But faith is much more than this. Faith is more than ideas. Faith is related to the relationship we have with God as a person, not what we think about him, but who he is. Doubting is about coming to a person, Jesus, and seeking him, no matter what answers we may come to. What would it look like to say in prayer, Jesus, I really don't understand how to make sense of this story in the Bible. It feels weird and out of place and makes me uncomfortable. Telling the author of this whole story we are a part of that this doesn't really make sense to me is a really big change in our viewpoint. We've been given a big gift as believers. God is available to us at any moment. And God's in an idea we are tasked to make sense of. He's a person, he's someone for us to talk to. In the book of Job, there's a great picture we're given to help us understand doubt and confusion. Job is someone that experienced huge uncertainty all really quickly. He spends a ton of time bringing his questions to God, like 30 chapters worth of complaint and confusion. Here's an example in Job. Why do the wicked prosper, growing old and powerful? They live to see their children grow up and settle down, and they enjoy their grandchildren. Their homes are safe from every fear and God does not punish them. Job's questions seem fair, right? He's been incredibly faithful to God, yet he's experienced huge tragedy and trauma. Meanwhile, the wicked, the people that don't recognize God at all, live safe and sound. What gives? Is God out to get me? Why would God allow evil for me and not for them? Why does God allow evil at all? Well, after 30 chapters of questioning God, Job gets a reply back. But it's not what he thinks. God has this to say to Job. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Where are you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined the dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. God answers Job's questions with some of his own. Job wasn't interested in coming to God and looking to journey through his doubt with God. Instead, Job was just looking for answers. So God taught Job a tough lesson. Job couldn't even begin to understand the complexity and the mystery of the world God had created. God speaks of the wonders of how he created and ordered the universe, and Job sits in awe. Job wanted answers, but he was left with only God himself. While there are certainly helpful answers to some of our questions that we can find, God ultimately isn't looking to explain his every move. He's looking to be with us in our doubt. And this seemed to comfort Job. He says this later in the book. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom without knowledge? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen and I will speak. I have some questions for you and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Job's last words are super important. Now that Job has met with God, been with him, seen him with his own eyes, he realized the difference between talking about him or questioning him from afar and being with God in his doubt. We need to seek God, not just answers. 
and to doubt, well, we need to hold on to what we know to be true. When we doubt parts, it doesn't have to unravel all our other beliefs as well. Doubt can be scary. It can feel like the rug is being pulled out from under us. But when we doubt, we need to hold on to what we know to be true while we investigate our questions and doubts with God and others. Do you know God to be good? You can hold on to that as you navigate doubt. Whether you know that from scripture or from experience, you can hold on to what you know to be true about God as an anchor as you navigate other questions about faith. Maybe you don't know anything about God for certain. Is there someone you can trust that you can hold on to? Find what's true and hold on to it. Doubt sometimes feels like a maze, but we don't have to walk it alone. God desires us to pursue him in our doubt. It's with him we will find comfort and answers in our doubt.